Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ray Speciali. I'm a lawyer who does some work here for AOPA. I work particularly with the legal service plan at AOPA. Tonight's presentation is aircraft ownership in multi-member LLCs. I was expecting to have my colleague Ferdy Mack here tonight, but Ferdy was unable to make it. Uh, without his presence, you're stuck with me solo, and uh, we won't be able to handle questions as we go tonight, uh, but near the end of the presentation, I'll give you some uh, information on how you could present questions to Pilot Information Center and or to uh, us over at PPS if you're a Pilot Protection Services member. Uh, now, this particular presentation is the second in a three-part series. The general theme of the three-part series is trying to defray aircraft ownership costs. Last month, we did one on co-ownership. Tonight's presentation will be on another common way to defray aircraft costs through the method of multi-member LLCs. And then in August, I think it's going to be August 9th, we're going to have another, uh, the third of the series that's going to relate to uh, putting your aircraft up on a leaseback. So tonight's focus, again, will be on multi-member LLCs as a method of trying to defray costs. And, and it is, frankly, one of the most commonly uh, used methods, and it's one that I get an awful lot of questions about during my time over in uh, Pilot Protection Services and Legal Services Plan. Uh, for tonight's presentation, I first wanted to give you a little bit of an overview as to what to expect as we walk through. This is basically your 30,000 foot overview, and it's a table of contents for what we'll be doing. I'm going to start by talking about why would you want to use an LLC. Uh, we'll talk about the differences between an LLC and co-ownership, try to get into some of the details there, can't do everything, but we'll try to give you an overview of the pros and cons of each. We'll also talk about really, and this is a non-legal uh, issue, you know, how do you find the right people to get involved in this, the right match for what your particular circumstances might be. Uh, we'll also talk about financing issues. Uh, I'm going to go over then, and sort of, it's almost like a chronological order. How do you get an aircraft registered when you're using an LLC? There's a little bit more to it than most people think, and I'm going to try to give you some basics in terms of how to get that aircraft registered. We'll talk about the all important then next, what happens when you get into this, right? How do you take care of the details of running this LLC? So we'll talk about an LLC operating agreement and some of the key ingredients that should be thought about as you construct that agreement. And hopefully you're constructing it with your counsel available. I'm going to talk also about what kind of operating models you might use. I sure can't talk about all of them, but I'm going to talk about two of the most common. I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of what my preference is and why, and then uh, leave it to you and counsel to decide what might work best for you. Near the end, we'll talk about what happens near the end of the time that the aircraft may be in the LLC. How does the aircraft get transferred out of the LLC, or how does a particular member leave the LLC and maybe bring in a new member into the LLC? Uh, finally, I'll give you some information on how to send questions over uh, over to a PIC. If they're legal in nature, they'll try to get you referred out to counsel and or if you're a legal service plan member, they'll send you up to us and I'll, we'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, the first question, and this is really where the whole thing gets started. Why would you want to use an LLC? And a LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. One thing that a lot of people misunderstand is that an LLC is not a corporation. It is a special type of entity. Uh, they've been around, I think, since maybe the late 80s and early 90s. And they are just what they say they are, a limited liability company. It's a special type of entity that's now recognized in virtually every state. The LLC does allow for people to defray the cost of aircraft ownership simply and by virtue of the fact that you're bringing in several people to own an airplane. And hopefully that divvies up the expenses in a way that makes it more affordable for all the various 
folks involved. Now, the people involved in an LLC are, and the owners in the LLC, are referred to as members. They're not stockholders, they're not co-owners, they're referred to as members. So that's going to be the term of art that we'll use throughout the presentation. The main reason, when I'm talking to folks, that they're thinking about an LLC is because they want to try to eliminate the kind of cross-liability problems that you would typically have with a co-ownership. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds, but often folks are trying to eliminate cross-liability issues. What I mean by that is they're trying to eliminate liability for mishaps that some other member might get involved in <coughs> while operating the aircraft. Another thing, though, that uh, folks don't think about, one other advantage to an LLC, besides the potential liability advantage and pro liability protection advantage from cross-liability issues, is that um, you can often find a way to more easily transfer membership interests in the LLC to others. And uh, that's a benefit for several reasons, which we'll talk about throughout this. But unlike a co-ownership, you won't have to refile a registration application every time you get a new member in or out like you would with a co-ownership. Uh, and really now, as a way to contrast the two, I tried to put together a little chart that you can use if you refer back to this that kind of lays out the basic pros and cons contrasting, you know, an LLC and a co-ownership. We did go over the co-ownership last month in the first of this series. And one of the great things about a co-ownership is its overall simplicity. You really don't have to worry about any particular filings with the state to get it up and running. Uh, you should put together a co-ownership agreement that will lay out the rights and duties of each of the various co-owners. Uh, but as the chart indicates, one of the disadvantages to the co-ownership is the fact that the various co-owners do have liability for the negligence or acts of their fellow co-owners. Uh, it's generally cheaper to go ahead and put together a co-ownership. Uh, it does require some documentation, but not nearly the kind of complexity that you'd be dealing with when you're getting into an LLC. So with the LLC, you do have that, as it indicates on the chart there, the kind of limitation on cross-liability, liability for other members' mishaps. Uh, but remember, and this is important, you will always have personal exposure to liability when you're operating the aircraft. Okay, That doesn't disappear just because you're in an LLC. I often get a call from a member, and this is one of the more widely asked questions. I'll say, well, I'm thinking about owning an aircraft, and uh, I'm going to be the only one flying it. What's the benefit of an LLC? I'll often say, I'm at a loss. I really don't know why you would do that. It's, in fact, often a disadvantage because now you have to deal with all the paperwork, the cost, et cetera. If you're the only one operating it, maybe better to just leave it in your name individually. But with a, a multi-member LLC, there may be some advantages to that liability protection. But you will, as that chart indicates, you're going to have to deal with higher costs to get it set up. You're going to have filing expenses with the state. You're going to have to deal with articles of organization. That's what you originally filed to get things underway. You're probably going to have to file tax returns, as we'll discuss later on. You may very well have to deal with leases. Uh, you're going to probably have to deal with annual tax returns, maybe state reports in order to keep that LLC running. Uh, usually there are annual fees that you will pay. I know that in my home state here in Maryland, if you've got an LLC, it's $300 a year. I've heard from members out in California, and I can't remember the exact amount, but it's $800, $900 a year to keep that LLC up and running. So that's just a rough idea of you know what kind of pros and cons you've got, what kind of differences there are between the LLC and co-ownership. 
at the same time you're thinking about, well, what kind of entity will we want to place this aircraft in, especially if you're talking about multiple owners, and in this case, multiple members. You're also going to want to be thinking about, well, and you should be thinking about this long before you get started, right? What kind of folks do I want to get involved with here? It might just be one other, two others, three others. Uh, you want to find the right match. And uh, up on the screen there, there's a couple of uh, or a few considerations that you might be thinking about. Uh, what kind of aircraft do we want to use, right? Is it going to be mostly for business? Is it going to be for personal use? Is it going to be a combination of both for the various uh, individuals involved? What kind of equipment do we need in that aircraft? Uh, one thing that doesn't get thought of too much is uh, insurance limits, right? You will want to make sure that uh, depending on the limits you want to get on your policy that you've got a group of members who will all qualify for those limits. We'll talk about the types of limits that you need to be concerned about later, but if you want to eliminate, for instance, any sublimits, and when I say sublimits I refer to things like per passenger or per seat limits, you may need to ensure that everybody's got certain types of ratings and hours in time and type and overall hours in order to make sure everyone's going to meet the requirements. So you want to select compatible members for a number of reasons, including insurance. Um, you also want to make sure on a little bit more uh, a softer front, right, certainly again non-legal front, do personalities match? Um, Sometimes that's hard if you haven't worked with some of these folks in a while. And sometimes even if you have worked with them, when you get involved in this circumstance, you might find out things about people that you didn't know before. So you want to be careful. You want to think this through ahead of jumping into a multi-member LLC or co-ownership for that matter. You, you're going to probably need to divvy up some responsibilities, things like scheduling. You, the good news is nowadays you've got a lot of electronic means for trying to schedule things. They're handy, they're easy to use, so not a lot of individual attention and time needs to be spent with that, but nonetheless, there needs to be some thought given. Somebody's also going to have to deal with lawyers or accountants. Who's the lucky winner for that? So you're going to need to designate someone who might be willing and able and ready to do that kind of work. Um, and is anybody going to be willing to take the lead on maintenance responsibilities? All of this is going to have to be dealt with. You're all going to have to agree on uh, whether everyone's going to deal with all of these issues or whether they will be delegated to particular members as this LLC matures and progresses. So this is a lot to think about. Usually it's best thought about before you actually embark on this endeavor. And we often see folks not doing that, uh, but we would counsel you as best you can to do that kind of thinking prior to purchasing an aircraft and planning to put it into a multi-member LLC. I uh, want to address for a couple of minutes here financing. Usually what we see, and, and folks will often ask me, well, how, how is this going to work? And usually what we'll see is that if there's any financing required, that the individual members, the individual members of the LLC will on their own finance their share of the aircraft purchase. Some of them may have the ability to pay cash all in. Some of them may have to borrow. So the usual model we see is that the individual members who need to borrow to make their initial capital contribution will do so. They'll be on the hook for that loan themselves. And usually you'll want to avoid having the LLC borrowing the money and having the aircraft used as collateral. Why could that be problematic? because you do often have members coming in and out of the LLC. It can be very complex. In fact, it can be uh, a real violation of your loan agreement if you've got new people coming in and out. So you want to try to avoid that 
uh, complexity, you want to try to avoid that confusion. So usually it is individual members who are doing the financing. And, and of course, if you do somehow wind up with the LLC financing the aircraft, you can almost bet that the bank or financial institution is going to require personal guarantees uh, from any of the members involved in the loan, even if you weren't one of them who needed to borrow. So it is usually something to avoid. I guess that's some of the basics when it comes to uh, the financing issue. Once everything is in place, the money's ready to go and you're ready to purchase the aircraft, the next step is going to be actually making the purchase. Uh, the bill of sale is actually pretty simple overall. Uh, whoever the seller is is going to fill out that typical FAA Form 8050-2, the FAA Bill of Sale form, and that Bill of Sale form will indicate that the purchaser is the LLC. So whatever you've named it, XYZ LLC, that's what's going to show up on the Bill of Sale. This is unlike, remember, the co-ownership where the purchaser had to essentially be each of the individual co-owners. So uh, in this case, it's much simplified and all we've got is the LLC as the named purchaser. What's a little bit more complex is going to be registering the aircraft in the LLC. I won't be able to go over everything, but I want to run through some of the highlights and some of the details of how you go about registering the aircraft. I'll often get a call from a member, well, I submitted the LLC paperwork, I submitted the bill of sale, and I submitted the registration application, and the FA kicked it back. Well, I'd have to say nine out of ten times it's because they were missing certain required documents. So I wanted to address this here. Again, when you're handling registration, for an LLC, you're going to use, just as you would in any other case, you're going to use a registration application, typically an 8050-1 form. Okay, and good news is FAA's got that form online, so you don't need all those carbon copies anymore. You can just print it up online, type in the information, and you're ready to go. Under the type of registration, They've now been kind enough, finally, after I think a couple of decades, to put on the form that you can specifically use item number three, which says corporation includes LLC. So as I indicated before, an LLC is not a corp, but for purposes of this form, you can check that box number three, and it says includes LLC. All you need to do is put in the name of the LLC as indeed the applicant for registration. Uh, one thing to be sure about is that your LLC qualifies as a U.S. citizen. We hardly ever see this become a problem, but you do have to be cognizant of the issue. In order to qualify as a U.S. citizen, two-thirds of the board or managing members or officers and 75% of the voting interest, the voting members and their interest needs to be owned or controlled by persons who are U.S. citizens. So be cognizant of that and uh, note that. And the FAA is going to ask you about that. And where that's going to come in, and this is a good segue uh, to the next uh, slide is that you're going to need to fill out what is often called the LLC statement. And basically, you're going to include your articles of organization, certificate of formation, whatever your state might happen to call it, that's going to need to go in. You'll need to send a copy of that to the FA along with this written LLC statement. I've detailed everything that they would typically ask for here. But in essence, what it's asking you to do is enumerate who the members of the LLC are. You're certifying that they are, in fact, U.S. citizens. You're also telling the FAA whether or not these members are, in fact, uh, managing members or whether the, they are just simply members. And you're also going to indicate on there whether or not the LLC is managed by the members 
or by a specifically designated managing member? That's going to be one of their questions because they want to know who's in charge and they want to make sure that the people involved are all U.S. citizens. Okay? Normally, once this is all in place, um, if you do have members who are not U.S. citizens, you're going to need to explain. And if later on you have moved or shifted from, let's say, for instance, a member managed LLC to a manager managed LLC, you're going to need to let the FA know about that. Otherwise, the good news is that changes in ownership will be sort of seamless with no need to go ahead and re-register the aircraft every time you change LLC members. Now, uh, so, so keep in mind that's an absolute requirement. You can't do anything without that LLC uh, statement. Once all that's in place, um, and actually to some degree concurrent with all of that, you're going to want to go ahead and think about what do we do to set the ground rules for this LLC. And the way you set the ground rules is usually through what we call an operating agreement. And, and this is what it's termed in most states that I'm familiar with. It's really a written agreement that details what folks within the LLC need to do, right? How's it going to be run? It's like bylaws for a corporation or the co-ownership agreement that we talked about last month if you're in a co-ownership. It should be drafted, I can't emphasize this enough, or at least reviewed by competent legal counsel uh, licensed in your state. Uh, they can give it a good critical eye or help you draft it to make sure it's put together in a way that uh, we'll try to address as much of what might happen as possible. You can't always capture everything, but you want to try to capture as much as you can in that agreement. Uh, my own style, you could incorporate aircraft operating rules in that operating agreement, or you could leave the business matters to the operating agreement and refer to aircraft operating rules in a separate agreement and allow that to be amended in a little bit more um, seamless fashion from time to time. That's, that's a personal choice, and I know lawyers who like to do it different ways, but that is a possibility. Uh, some of the specific ingredients that you might want to lay into this operating agreement. Again, I'm, I'm unable to cover everything, but I'd like to set out some of the highlights or key ingredients for this. You, of course, want to identify <coughs> the names of the parties, right? Who's involved? You want to certainly specify that this is an LLC. In identifying the party somewhere in there, you're going to want a schedule showing what kind of interest. When I say interest, what I really mean is what percentage interest each of the individual members or the members may have in the LLC. If you've got a managing member, you're going to want to designate that for sure in this operating agreement. Uh, one thing that sometimes pops up, if you think that additional contributions may be needed later on for larger purchases, let's say avionics upgrades, things like that, you may want to specify whether additional contributions can be made mandatory, how many votes or what percentage of voting is required in order to get approval for additional contributions. This needs to be addressed in the early stages. To try to address it once things are underway may be too little too late. So make sure that you've thought that through. Uh, with voting rights, you're going to want to make sure that you're clear on whether voting rights are determined by membership percentages, by number of members, what kind of vote will authorize a particular action. Does it need to be unanimous? Can it be a majority vote? Does it need to be 60% of the members? It's up to you at this point to choose that. And I can't tell you that there's any one way that's going to work every time. This is going to be something that's up to you as you put this together with discussions with counsel. You're also going to want to deal with, and this is really important and often 
neglected in terms of the details, what's going to happen when ownership interest or membership interest in this LLC are transferred? People are going to come in and out of that LLC. You at least want to plan for that. Uh, sometimes people die. Sometimes people get sick. They can't fly anymore. They might lose their medical. They might have to leave because their job has moved them out of town. You've got to be thinking about that. You've got to be thinking about what's going to happen when someone decides to withdraw. How are we going to value their interest in this LLC? Uh, is the LLC going to buy back their interest? Is it going to need a, a right of first refusal, for instance? Um, if the LLC doesn't want to buy it back, well, are they going to be able to sell that interest to a third party who needs to be approved by the remaining members in the LLC? All of this is going to require some thought up front. You don't want to wing it and have this sort of thing happen in the middle of the process and then run into trouble. So those are a few of the things. A few other things that might be thought about is, well, if we do have a new member who might come in, how are we going to go about the admission process? Is it going to require a unanimous vote? Do two-thirds of the members, three-quarters, majority vote? How are we going to do this? Another very important issue to be addressed right up front. One other thing that often is ignored too, and I like to have folks think about it way up front is, as you go through this, uh, people are going to have to be writing checks, right? And these checks are going to go to, and this is worth stating now and again several times, the LLC is going to need an individual, it's going to need its own bank account. These checks can't be going from members to vendors or mechanics or whoever you might be using. Otherwise, the point of the LLC is defeated, right? It's no longer being treated like an entity. So the LLC at least is going to need its own separate bank account. But as money goes in, are you going to want to collect a certain amount of reserves, you know, either on a per hour of use basis or some other basis? Because you know that someday out there you are going to need to upgrade avionics. You know someday out there you are going to need an overhaul. You know there's going to be a need for a paint job. How do you deal with that? I've always thought, and not everybody agrees with it, but this is just my view, that it's better to collect as you go. Because if you don't, it does leave the door open for people to potentially withdraw right before there is a significant event that might cost some additional money. So. I've also advocated that there be, in many cases, a second bank account where those reserves are held so that it's much harder to violate those for day-to-day -day operating expenses. I urge you to think about that as you go through this and carefully think about the numbers that you need to make this a viable LLC. Uh, you're going to want to talk about insurance, right? What kind of limits do you want? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in just a few minutes, but this is clearly something that where you want to spell out what kind of minimum uh, liability limits you want, um, what kind of insurance company you may want to work with. This needs to be thought through now. You're going to want to think about, well, who's going to handle tax matters? Uh, in many cases, and we'll, we'll talk about the different models of, of how the, of the different ways this might work, but often, the LLC may need to file a tax return, uh, federal and state. So who's going to take care of that? Uh, how do you want to be recognized for tax purposes? These are things that are going to need to be agreed to. Uh, aircraft operations, again, something I'll discuss in detail a few minutes from now, but that's something else that should either be referred to in the operating agreement or laid out specifically in that. LLC operating agreement. And then finally, you want to have some provision. This isn't the most uh, pleasant topic to be thinking about right at the beginning, but you want to think about, well, look, if there is a dispute, what law will govern the dispute? What venue will we bring that dispute to? Um, 
because often you might have LLC members from different states, depending on where you might be located. So you want to make sure that you've thought this through early and that you're saying, look, we're, we're going to do this. For instance, I'm here in Maryland. We're going to have all disputes governed by the courthouse in Maryland in our county. Uh, or I've seen in some LLC operating agreements drafted up by colleagues that they prefer to use uh, alternative dispute resolution, things like arbitration or mediation, and they'll build that right into the agreement. It lays it all out at the beginning so there's no questions as you move forward, another important consideration. Uh, a little bit of a, an emphasis now on the insurance question. Uh, you do need to be mindful of the fact that if we're talking about more than four or five members, and this is not more art than science, right? This, th there's no rules on this, but this is what I hear from insurance folks. Then you might be crossing the line over to uh, a flying club rather than an LLC that owns an aircraft with members. Um, and that is to some degree a flying club as well. But once you move into flying club, for purposes of insurance, the rates will increase significantly. So usually with the type of operation that we're talking about here, we're generally referring to a, a, an LLC membership of no more than four or five. This is something you'd want to check out with your carrier or broker. Uh, normally, if you want to get a $1 million smooth policy, which means no sublimits, you know those limits where there's $100,000 per passenger, per uh, seat, things like that, you'll usually need to have about 500 hours with at least 250 hours in the maker model and no claims in the last five years. Uh, this can vary pretty widely from carrier to carrier, so you're going to want to make sure. And this would actually be best to think about as members are being solicited, right? You want to make sure you're soliciting members that'll fit this profile. Uh, and also think about the fact that if there's an open pilot clause that you want, it will generally be removed once you get past four or five named insured. Again, this will vary a lot from carrier to carrier, but it's the sort of thing that you want to think about early. Another set of details that need to be considered it, it really relates to how the airplane itself will be operated. And again, this could vary widely. I often get members who say, ask me, well, send me the generic document for this. And you know, yes, there are certain things that you'll want in your checklist, but you and your colleagues are going to have to think this through. What kind of operations are you going to permit, right? Uh, do you want to specify runway type and length. Some folks might not want their tricycle gear uh, operating on grass strips. That's, you know, that's something you need to think about earlier. You don't want to be fighting about that later on. Uh, are international ops going to be a, a, a problem? Or are you willing to allow for that? How do you want to leave that airplane, right? That's something that most LLCs will want to specify, well, you've got to leave it the way you found it, and hopefully that's going to be in good condition. Uh, currency rules, uh, you want to generally stick with the FAA rules on things like that. You know, what's going to happen when we're using it for instructional flights? What kind of scheduling priorities are we going to put in place? The good news from my perspective is that while I will hear about disputes within LLCs, and often they're minor issues, uh, one thing I don't hear a lot about are scheduling disputes. So people seem to have worked out a way to, to schedule aircraft and that seems to work well. But maybe it's because they are thinking about it ahead of time and they're actually laying those ground rules out. They're laying out preference weeks, preference, week, preference weekends well ahead of time. So uh, while I get a lot of questions about what kind of rules need to be put in place, uh, scheduling seems to have worked itself out in many cases and it could be to some degree that the electronic means of scheduling has helped to smooth out some of the potential rough spots with that. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about operating models. I'm calling it operating models, all right? And 
This is, is a, an area that is often neglected. Um, and it's an area where I see different approaches. Uh, it does need to be thought through carefully. There's no doubt in my mind it needs to be thought through by you and local council. I'm going to go over the two types of models that I'll typically see. I'll throw in my own two cents about which one I prefer and why, uh, but one of the methods that I will see is what I'll call the co-ownership model. And you might say, well, co-ownership, this is an LLC. Well, what I mean by this is that the members of the LLC and the LLC is treating the aircraft just as an a co-ownership as they would a co-ownership. The folks involved in the, the uh, membership and in the LLC are just simply writing checks to the LLC and they're in fact laying out what they're saying we're going to put money in and the LLC is going to pay money out for insurance, for hangar, for things like that. And in fact uh, they're really not running it like a business and, and in many states that's not required because in many states all you need to do is be running an LLC for any lawful purpose. So it, it might work. I have some concerns about it myself because uh, really if you look at it, it might look like that LLC is nothing more than an alter ego for the individual members of the LLC. They're co-mingling the use of an LLC asset for their own personal use. Uh, because of that, I've been often weary about treating the LLC as a sort of souped up co-ownership. I know I'll hear about saying that, but uh, that is a concern that I've harbored for years as I've seen these different models. The model that I've preferred to see put in place and that I've often put in place from my own uh, clients has typically been what I'll call the leasing model. Okay? With the leasing model, what's going on is that the LLC, which indeed owns the aircraft, you should always remember that, once you place the aircraft in an LLC and that LLC has title to the aircraft, you don't own an aircraft. You own a membership in an LLC that owns an aircraft, but it's the LLC that owns that airplane. So how do you get to use the airplane if you don't own it? Well, one way that makes sense is that you will need to pay to get possession and use of that aircraft. And when we lawyers talk about getting possession and use of an asset, that equals leasing or renting the aircraft. So you would, in this model that I'm referring to, you would indeed be leasing it from the LLC. And it would require then that there be leases between the LLC, the members that might be using the aircraft. And uh, one added benefit to this model is that if, let's for instance say that I'm a member and I'm using the aircraft in part for my personal use and in part for my business use. Uh, what I've often liked to do with that scenario is I would be leasing it from the LLC individually and I'd have an individual lease with the LLC for my personal use and then if I had a business entity, uh, you know, a corporation or another LLC that uses it for business purpose, that entity would be leasing it and it would be much easier for that entity to then keep track of its expenses for use of the aircraft for tax purposes. Uh, so that's one advantage I like to see that comes from this leasing model. The other thing about the leasing model that needs to be thought through is there are tax consequences because now that LLC is actually in the business of renting aircraft. It gets rental income from the various members and from the users. Remember, the, the users don't necessarily have to be the members. Of course, your insurance company will have to approve of all this. It will need to be run by your insurance company. 
Again, I haven't seen too many problems with insurance companies approving of this sort of thing, but that all needs to be run by them. But you've got now different users. And the revenue, the leasing revenue, is going to go to the LLC. It's going to go to the LLC's bank account. The LLC will then write checks for hangar, for insurance, for maintenance, and all the other things that need to be paid for. Typically, that will require two streams of income. All right, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but typically what it's going to require is one stream of income that's going to be fixed. And what I mean by that is whether I'm flying the aircraft or not as a member, there are going to be these fixed costs. So whether I fly it or not, I'm going to have to pay some amount in each month or each quarter to cover these fixed costs. That's a calculation that should be made early on and that should be shared by each of the members typically evenly. And then there would be on top of that fixed stream of income to the LLC, there would be a an hourly or use-based rate that would apply, for instance, a per hour rate that's built in whenever I use the aircraft. That's where I often see folks build in a reserve. And when the LLC gets paid, part of that might get diverted to the LLC's reserve account. Some of it goes into the operating account. And then it gets paid accordingly to the various vendors and whoever else is getting paid for the uh, operation of the aircraft. Um, now, that does bring to mind that there are tax consequences because there are revenues and expenses and depreciation. So what I'd often see with this model is that the cash in is going to roughly equal the cash out, maybe with the exception of the reserves that are built up, and that's a good thing. Uh, but what you'll often see, especially in the first five or six years of this aircraft's life, while it's being depreciated, is that there will be losses. Those losses will often be attributable to depreciation expense. So how do you treat those losses? I'll leave that to you and your CPAs. I can tell you my own opinion on that is that typically those losses should be treated as what the IRS calls passive losses. And that means that the losses as they get essentially distributed to the individual members can't be used to offset your other sources of income like wages, salary, investment income, capital gains, uh, dividends, things like that. And what uh, then happens though, the good news is, it's bad news you can't use it to offset those other things, uh, at least the way I would handle it. Uh, the, the good news is, though, that those losses do get stored up, and eventually when you go to sell the aircraft, they may be used at that time to try to offset any gains that would accrue due to the depreciation that has been taken on that aircraft over the years. Uh, so there are some benefits to this approach, but I do leave it to you and your individual counsel and accountant to look at this issue carefully. Uh, there may also be some sales and use tax issues involved. A in some states, you get the benefit with the leasing model of perhaps being able to defer sales tax because you're now purchasing the aircraft for purposes of resale. I know that sounds crazy because you're not buying it to resell it, you're buying it to lease the plane. But in many states, or at least in some states, when you lease the plane, that's considered purchase for resale. So you might be able to defer that big chunk of sales or use tax, but then what needs to happen is that you need to collect sales and use tax on the individual flights for the aircraft and rental revenue, and then remit that to the state. Which model might work best for you? Again, you'll need to look at it. You'll need to project what kind of use you're going to get out of the airplane and make a determination. And you're going to have to see if your state has such provisions. It varies very widely from state to state. So that's the leasing model. Uh, I tend to think that that model actually reflects the reality of the fact that the members don't own the aircraft that they need to pay to gain the possession and use of the aircraft through a lease.
Uh, what happens later on when you go to transfer your aircraft? Now we're getting a little closer to the end of the, the LLC cycle. And let's just say all of the members decide uh, they're going to move on. They're each going to go out and buy their own airplane. We're going to sell this airplane. Uh, this is probably the simplest of all the scenarios. What will happen then is they're just going to transfer the asset. So there will be a bill of sale that goes from the LLC to whoever the third party purchaser might be. Uh, there may be, though, some tax consequences to the individual sellers. Remember I said before, if you use the leasing model, there may have been some depreciation on the aircraft and you're going to have to factor that in if there are some losses that have been built up passive losses you may be able to use them to offset any of that depreciation recapture um, so this all needs to be thought through carefully with legal and tax counsel prior to the sale to make sure that you understand what the consequences will ultimately be Another type of transfer that may occur besides just selling the whole aircraft is a transfer of some particular member's individual interest in the LLC. So that's what I'm talking about here with the next slide where we're talking about an individual transfer. And what's going to happen here is going to really be more of a, an internal transaction, at least most of the time. So there won't usually be a need for an FAA bill of sale because all that's happening is that perhaps one member is going to be transferring their interest or they're going to be assigning their interest in the LLC to a new member or to the current members of the LLC. Or they might even be assigning their membership interest back to the LLC. That can usually be done with an internally drafted document, again, using legal counsel, to draft it and allow for that assignment of an interest, okay? Uh, I, I certainly uh, would encourage really uh, very strongly that that be in a written document that lays out the price that was paid for that assignment and that that be kept in both the LLC's records and in the records of the member who might be assigning their interest or picking up a new interest. Uh, generally, the good news is, is that there won't be any sales or use tax consequence to this kind of transfer of an interest because in most states, virtually all that I'm aware of anyway, sales and use tax applies to a transfer of an interest in tangible personal property, right? property that can be touched and moved. An interest in an LLC is not tangible personal property. So usually when we're talking about a transfer of an interest in an LLC, there are typically no sales or use tax consequences. Again, needs to be checked on with local uh, council, tax council, uh, but this has been one of the advantages that we see to an LLC when we're talking about multi-member LLCs for aircraft ownership. And there may be, again, income tax consequences to the seller, often when there was depreciation on the aircraft over the years. So these are the kinds of things that need to be thought through. Um, I've tried to address in this presentation the most common questions that I get from members when I'm discussing LLC in a multi-membership setting with the members who I talk to at the legal services plan. But you may have your own individual questions. If you do, uh, we're going to put up here now the uh, Pilot Information Center number. Uh, if you've got legal or tax questions, they're going to at least be able to get you referred out to local counsel or hopefully local tax counsel who can help you with those questions. If you're a member of the legal services plan, uh, we're glad to field your calls, answer your questions. Uh, purchase and sale of an aircraft is a covered matter under the legal services plan, and we stand ready to answer your individual questions as they may come. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you tonight to address you tonight. 
uh, and I look forward to working with you individually as members as we go forward. Again, uh, Ray Speciality, my pleasure to, uh, to be able to present this to you this evening. Have a good night.